Because of the following special program, Wonder Woman and the Incredible Hulk will not be presented this evening. Star Wars news in a single file. This is Making Tracks. Here is your host, Mark Newbold. That's not true. That's impossible. Welcome to the premiere episode of Making Tracks. I'm your host, Mark Newbold, and I'm joined today by, well, I'll let you introduce yourself, Dave. Tell everybody who you are. Well, hi everyone. My name's Dave. Uh, I am a member of the Fanta Tracks team, and uh, you'll probably, if if you are um, a sucker for punishment, you probably may have seen the Fanta Tracks YouTube channel, of which, along with Martin Keeler, I co-produce uh, content and videos for. Uh, most of them are complete nonsense, um, uh, as you'll probably tend to find out in the rest of this. Uh, very first debut podcast episode, uh, which I am privileged to be on. So thank you very much for having me on here, Mark. Well, it's my pleasure. It's my pleasure. I, I, there were other people I wanted to ask, but they were all busy. So, so I thought I'd ask you. Um, yeah. Oh, well, I, I, I feel like I am the Uncle Buck of Fanta Tracks. <laughs> um, you know, when, when there's absolutely no one else left to ask, uh, I am like the last... Last line of defence, the last resort. Um, don't, don't think of it that way, Dave. Think of it, you know, when you love someone, you give them your last rollo, don't you? The best chip is the last one on the plate, so just think of it that way. Well, that, that is true. I mean, if you can get through this very first episode, yeah, they can only go up from here. There is that. You know, uh, that. each one will progressively get better and better and better. That's how I like to think of it. I like your logic. Uh, you know, my, my current screensaver is a beautiful uh, sort of uh, alpine view of a mountain with like <laughs> ski slopes and such. I'm just imagining this podcast going backwards up a ski slope. That, that's, uh, that's how I've got it in my head. Now. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Like, uh, uh, get get the old VHS like recorder, <laughs> like hit rewind and like adjust the tracking, and, and tracking. you should be good. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. So we've got loads to talk about on this show. We've got loads of guests. We've got loads of content. Loads of cool stuff. Uh, so before we start rabbiting on, because you and me can talk forever, let's, let's go straight into the first interview because it's kind of the centrepiece of the show. Uh, a few months ago, actually the back end of last year, myself, Paul Naylor, Carl Bayliss and Claire Henry all had the good fortune to interview in Nuneaton, the Riviera of the Midlands, the one and only <laughs> director of Rogue One, Gareth, Gareth Edwards, which was rather cool because he's from Nuneaton, as I say. And they did a screening of Rogue One for charity at a, a local. Uh, like, it was like a cinema. It was it was like a um, a theatre, but they'd done it all out as a cinema. And he was there, and we were very fortunate to be able to speak to him, which which was kind of cool, I would say. That's very cool. I mean, like, h- how often do people get that kind of opportunity? Um, I mean, that that that's like just phenomenal. Like, you guys must have been absolutely buzzing. Uh, yeah. After after that, so like uh, no, let, let's give it a listen. We, we were buzzing. We were. Ba- I was bouncing around like Ross in an episode of Friends. It was. I've, I don't think my feet have left the floor quite so often. Um, <laughs> that could be taken the wrong way. But but it was it was very exciting. In fact, we were we we were in the foyer, uh, just getting ready before we started this interview, and he was kind of accosted by various people, and uh, Claire. Uh, intrepid Panther Tracker managed to drag him away for this interview, which we will listen to right now. Whatever your opinion was the last time you saw it, it flips the opposite. So if you think, actually, it's pretty good, yeah. and then you watch it next time, you go, oh, it's rubbish. So you think it's rubbish, and then you look at it and go, oh, that's all right, actually, it's not that bad. Yeah. And so my pendulum on this is, it's, I don't, <laughs> I'm not as happy. So well, I'm glimps- glimpsing it now, going, oh, it's actually yeah. not that bad. Well, I, I, uh, I was saying to the guys, my, um, my, my mum and dad's best friend has his own cinema on top of his house and it's what converted, it's wrong? got like red velvet <laughs> sides, it's converted, he's pulled all these chairs up and everything. So when I go home to Bangor, which is where I'm from, he's like, oh Claire's coming home, that means we can watch Star Wars. So he's like phoned and he's already said, 
So he said, what, what do you want to watch this Saturday night in the cinema? And I'm like, oh, I'm watching Rogue One. And it's like, <laughs> and he's like, okay, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. I'll get it all set up so there'll be me, him, and my dad in this 20 seater cinema You're watching this film. Yeah. So you can come along if you want. All the games you can drink. Which direction's banger? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> we, we were talking in the foyer before downstairs, and uh, it was at the point where Saul Guerrero was talking to Jim and says, You've come to kill me. And it reminds me of a scene from Blake 7. Oh. Are you aware of that scene? No. If, oh. if it was stolen, it's stolen from Apocalypse Now. Really? Was <laughs> it? Was it? Well, as in, you know, yeah, like, yeah. It's, he's kind of, he's a little bit of everyone. He's a little bit of Che Guevara yeah. and uh, Colonel Kurtz mm. at the end. Yeah, it was definitely yeah. kind of that. It was, I feel like, because there's, you know, there's a section in our movie, like the problem when you make a film is, the simplest way to explain the structure of a film usually is like it's a three act structure and you have like an act one, an act two, an act three. Mm-hmm. Act one typically sets up all the problems and the, the goal of the movie. And then act two is trying to solve it the simplest, most logical way without changing as a person mm-hmm. and realizing you have to fundamentally change. Then act three is as a new person, you go and do the thing you could never have done if you hadn't had act two in it, which is sort of complicated, <coughs> isn't yeah. it? But And so our act two to some extent um, for a long time as we were designing the film was um, this journey into like which eventually became Saul Guerrero and we wanted it, it was obviously to go get find the father's you know the, the MacGuffin of the movie which is dad's message yeah. but along the way we wanted to witness like the you know the, the casualties of war and, and, the, and like try and show a side of Star Wars that yeah. you don't normally see but feels quite modern in terms yeah. of because I always felt like the I, l- I mean, my favourite movie is A New Hope, right? Yeah. So I love it to death. But it feels like I watched that as a kid and it was clear-cut, it was good and evil. And I... I that's kind of how I understood the world. Mm-hmm. And as you get older, you realise, you hear that evil people's point of view yeah. and you go, actually, they've got a point, they've got a valid opinion. And then you, and you just hear that you get... You, you know, our country gets called e- evil by these other countries... Yeah. Yeah. And you think, wait a minute, we're like more like the Empire sometimes. And yeah. so that flavour wanted to sort of show that version of Star Wars mm-hmm. where where the good guys are kind of so trying to do so much good that they're becoming bad. Yeah. And some of the bad guys, if you hear their point of view, like I wanted, I wanted to have a really loving like per, like father that you that's a, a decent human being, but he designed the, yeah, yeah. the nuclear bomb. Yeah. Like, I say, like say, um, it, it, it's it was a an amazing thing to have created but oh my god I wish I hadn't created it kind of attitude yeah, yeah. And I don't know if I said it in there but Robert Oppenheimer was yes. was very mm-hmm. much and I was familiar with him actually through my work I did loads of stuff at the BBC and one of them was about Hiroshima yeah. and he's such a captivating guy because he's obviously an, an absolute genius yeah. and there's that um, speech he does about I have become deaf destroyer of worlds yeah. that's so haunting yeah. where he seems so like guilt not guilt's probably the wrong word but um Regretful that things mm. have panned out the way they have, and yeah. and that character, I don't know. I think you could make, you could spend your whole career making a film yeah. about that kind of guy. I think that, that's probably why well, I'm, I'm guessing. But at the start of the film, we've got Cassian who just suddenly kills one of his friends and colleagues. And he's such a sort of, you know, not all good guys are, are that good. Yeah. Right. And, and that's what I got from that was, you know, there's another side to this guy. He's he's a, he's on the good side, but. Well, watch him. well, as you grow up, like you say, you, you, as a kid, you watch Star Wars and think this is the good guys, the black yeah. hats and the white hats. But you grow up and you realise the world's a bit more like Empire Strikes Back. Isn't yeah, it? yeah. And you've got that that grey in the middle, yeah. which yeah. that showed really well. Rogue oh, One, cheers. Your yeah. film. But it's like it's like we. I remember as a starting point because we'd always at the beginning it was like, what the hell are we going to do? Like, what is this? How do we begin? And as soon as you get like a pin in the map where you go, okay, that sounds good, that sounds like something, it, it, it's like doing a jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. It is really, making a film is very much like doing a jigsaw puzzle where you don't have the box <laughs> and you don't know what it's supposed to be. You've got all these yeah. pieces yeah. and you just start trying to find corners yeah. and things that go together yeah. and maybe it'll turn out this is completely wrong and it goes away. And, and, and I remember one of the, the experiments we would do to try and find corner pieces yeah. to just find something solid yeah. was like, okay, let's take A New Hope and just invert it. Mm. So, for instance, you go, there is this, New Hope is the story of a boy who grows up 
at home and dreams of joining a war. So let's say, let's have a girl who grows up in a war and dreams of returning home. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And that felt like there's so many movies that do that, like yeah. Gladiator and things that do it really well, and you go, okay, that feels good. Mm-hmm. So that's, wherever we go, I mean, let's, let's say that's the sort of concept. And, and we played with so many different versions. I mean, there was all sorts of versions. And the problem is, you say one, and people think it was like this thing that happened and, and then it got deleted. And yeah. you sort of go, no, that was just like spitballing in a room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And there were so many things that were thrown out. And some of them you go, that's really good. And you go, but that doesn't work with that bit. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Was there a freedom to that, though? The fact that you could spitball with all these story group guys and come up with this version, but that version works as well. I think you, that it was Noel on the page that Noel's thing was just a, an idea and that he worked off the back of that. Um, so John's thing was. But didn't he write that for the TV series originally? I don't know. I think I think well, I got it via an email, I, and then I met with John over Skype. I think he had to feel comfortable with me, I guess. <laughs> and so we met over Skype, and John's a hero of mine because my background was visual effects. Right. And so there's a really interesting story about John that's nothing to do with Star Wars that I love is, uh, so John made, obviously made Photoshop, yeah. right? Yeah. He's like the genius behind that with his brother. But one of the other things he did software-wise was a plug-in for a software that I use all the time called After Effects, oh, which is yeah. like it's also part of Adobe. And he did, it was called Lens Flare Pro. And it was a way of doing like more realistic looking lens flares in CGI yeah. and everyone who had to do anything real had to buy this plug-in or if you didn't af- couldn't afford it people would pirate it obviously yeah. <laughs> and when and obviously for some of the sequences in this film um, Zero Dark Thirty was a reference where they right. land at night and there's like yeah. this black you know stealth mission yeah. and the I think it was when it was either when we were making the film or at some point they released the files on what they captured from Osama bin Laden because they just grabbed computers, they grabbed everything yeah. and they grabbed a load of software and one of the things they grabbed was John Noel Lens Flare Pro. <laughs> 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 nice. <laughs> and, so, <laughs> yeah. and so I would joke, I, I, he would send me this, he sent us this link like, look at this. And I sort of write back going like, so you basically funded your child's education because obviously you helped pay for his kids to go to college. <laughs> from terrorism <laughs> and he would argue no I felt that because our software was particularly difficult to use we were delaying terrorist acts yeah. <laughs> by yeah, having a, a that you need to, try to get lens flare right? yeah. a six month course to be yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh brilliant brilliant so when you when you started on the project and you went into sit down in the room and crack, crack the story and work it out I think Gary Witter was on it first yes. there, wasn't he yeah so that was like this. So there's like, we're in San Francisco, and for about six months, and it probably is what you call the honeymoon period, right? Where you're kind of left alone and. They and love you guys there, by the way. I was at the Presidio the week, no, the day after you turned up and did the talk to all the staff, and Chris Agaropoulos, the PR guy, was there. Oh, yeah. And he said, you, got, you were there the day before, we just missed okay. it. Okay. November time or something like that. But he said how everybody walked out the room like that far off the floor because they really um, dug what you were saying. So you made um, a good impression. So. Just lied through my teeth. <laughs> 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 it, helps, it helps when you've got like running out of time. If you'd have to do overtime for nothing and that. <laughs> <laughs> but they, yeah. So we were in like a room, uh, and it kind of. The, I can't. I mean, I'm sort of trying to remember it. It was a little bit like half the time we were with uh, what you call the story group, which was mainly Kiri Hart. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. And, and Rain and and Pablo, um, Pablo. Pablo would Pablo. come in occasionally Lila. more to kind of like help with Pablo we've got this like what's canon what isn't Can right. we get, could we do this has anyone ever done that mm. is there a character that's done yeah. that um, and uh, John Schwartz who was the producer on the film he was a, he would join in that stuff and John Noel yeah and but then for a long long for a long period it'd also be just me and Gary yeah and we sort of felt like those of pre- it was kind of like it's like the dream scenario but also like the, the nightmare yeah, scenario yeah, because yeah. it's like you've got a whiteboard and all these <laughs> pens <laughs> and you're going no call to all right so um, okay and every day we would just go well let's just try and the problem is you have to rub it off the whiteboard at the yeah. end of the day 
So we, we would take a picture of it on our phone. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could probably pull out a picture for you if you want. Yeah. We'd take well, a picture yeah. of it <laughs> on our phone and then erase it all. Yeah. And then for comedy value, because we knew people would come in and be trying to look at what yeah. we'd written. So you just I, get really crazy. Yeah. So I did a whole film about how we would go to... Uh, I did a whole film about the, the Iwok... Um, and oh, Jar Jar. Oh, Caravana Courage! Nice. <laughs> you said this. Caravana Courage <laughs> Well, actually, like, to, the take the, <laughs> to take the pressure off, I did have two posters in my office. Um, one was Caravan of Courage. Nice. And the other one was the Holiday Special. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, dear. Oh, dear. Yeah. And then the problem is I totally forgot they were up. They were up, just, they were up, they were up for a joke to start with, as in, look, you've just got to be... <laughs> The, you know, Ewok Adventure, and you're going to be fine, yeah. right? It was kind of like the, the way we said it to ourselves. And then we, we, and then you forget they were there for a year, so you forget them. And then one day, I get a phone call, and George Lucas is come in, and so I'm like, "Fuck it, I've got to speak to George Lucas. This is like the dream and everything, but it's so surreal because you're showing him this Star Wars film, and it's yeah. just the weirdest thing you could ever do." And he cut in the first, I meet him in the office, and he's wandering in, and I suddenly realise I've got Caravan of Courage on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the That's holiday brilliant. special. <laughs> and I'm so desperately, like, you probably Don't thought I was, <laughs> yeah, I'm doing every visual <laughs> thing I can with my hands and, and trying to stand Strats. awkwardly around the room. Tell so me that, that your he's... whiteboard, storyboard. <laughs> 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 still got what's you know, no, fit. That was gone, that was gone. That was in San Francisco, thank you. But, uh, he, I hear, if he saw it, he didn't say anything. <laughs> well, he directed some of that, didn't he, Caravan? Did he? Because, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. They, they tried to keep it quiet, but he directed at least three yes. days. Yeah. Yeah. I interviewed yeah. Eric Walker years ago, and he yeah. saw, you know, George directed on that. The whole thing about Phantom was his return to directing. Right. He directed stuff on, on that. Yeah. Right. Obviously, the special edition, isn't it? I like He was probably really pleased. He was like, this is in the right hands. Yeah. <laughs> We're very privileged in the UK to have access to so many people who've had a part to play in the creation of Star Wars in one form or another. You know, we're, yeah. we're very spoiled in that sense. And, and give or take, you know, within, you know, five, six hours, you can be at one end of the country to the other to, like, be an event where, you know, some of these people uh, may be attending and you, you can get that kind of uh, interaction with them. But, like, for someone like Gareth, who... Because of what he does, you know, he, he, he doesn't really kind of have the time in his schedule to do this sort of stuff. No. For you guys to get that opportunity to do that, and and that that was all down to Claire, you say? That was Claire. That was definitely Claire. So we we were at this beautiful, well, beautiful. We were in the Neaton and lots it's of roads, the, concrete. It's the Riviera of the Midlands. It's though. the Riviera of the Midlands and <laughs> <laughs> the Neaton on Sea. And, and <laughs> so from where I am, Nuneaton's about 20 miles away. It's not that far away, really. It's fairly local to where I live in Burtwood. And so we'll, so the four Midlands team members all live sort of in seven, north, south, east and west, really, of Birmingham. So we all came together in Nuneaton. And, uh, yeah, so, so we're in the foyer and they're showing the film. And Gareth's there at the bar. And, and clearly he was bumping into like, old mates he knew at college or mates from sixth form. It was that kind of gathering, you know, the homecoming yeah, yeah. thing because the film had done so well. And you know, you know when you meet mates that you've known for years, and you really want to see them, and then you yeah. meet bump into guys that you knew at school, and you're perfectly pleasant and sociable with them, but you don't really want to be spending like that long with them. Yeah. I hope yeah. I'm not throwing shade on anyone, but I, my impression was that Gareth had kind of got stuck with two guys that he was not actually that fussed about being with. You know, they were sort of talking about stupid things he did in the back of the bus, and there was loads of that. And Gareth was perfect. He's, he's a polite fella, so he, you know, he was really nice about it so I, I'm the worst person in the world at getting people not just getting their attention because I, I kind of stand out being 6'4 but I'm lousy at sort of breaking the ice I'm not very good at going over and introducing myself and all that malarkey and I should because I've been doing this thing long enough but I'm just rubbish at it Claire's not rubbish at it she's got brass balls she will just go up and talk to anyone so uh, so Claire went up and was very forward and put a case forward that she really wanted to have a few minutes with Gareth and do this this interview, whereas I was sort of looking at him, and I think he recognised me because I had met him before, because me and Ruth had been to the Force Awakens after party, and we spoke to him there, and then I met him after, and he said, oh, I, rem- I said, you won't remember me. I said, we, we met at the after party. Oh, I remember you, the guy with the wife in the wheelchair. So he did remember me, he remembered Ruth, which is kind of funny. So I'm looking at him, and I'm thinking, you know, I think he knows me, but he doesn't know where he knows me from because he must meet thousands of people. But Claire just went barreling in and grabbed hold of him and said, excuse me, my name's Claire. Can I borrow you for an interview for a fan for tracks like this? 
And that is the worst impression ever. And so Gareth said, there's seats upstairs, let's go upstairs. So we went out of the foyer and up these stairs to a, like a room. He was gutted that you all came along with her. Yeah, he was absolutely gutted. <laughs> <laughs> Those losers. <laughs> Leave them downstairs. She like, could oh. have done it herself. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> setting the tone for the rest of the podcast. And, uh, and we get upstairs and we sit on this sofa, a lovely sofa. And in the corner is the screen showing Rogue One. And there we are interviewing Gareth. So what we just heard was part one. And part two will be coming in a couple of weeks on the second episode. If, I, if I'm still alive, because if Claire hears this, she might kill me. You'll never be able to like look her in the eye ever again, that's for sure. I'm too scared to look her in the eye. You're after something. Is it revenge? Money? Or is it something else? You look good. A little rough around the edges, but good. Heard about a job. Big shot gangster putting together a crew. I'm a driver. And I'm a flyer. I waited a long time for a shot like this. What do you think? Well, what do you know? You got a line on a ship? Yeah, I know a guy. He's the best smuggler around. I heard a story about you. I was wondering if it's true. Everything you heard about me is true. Whoa. <laughs> L3! Let's go with a mean man's face. Who are these guys? If you come with us, you're in this life for good. You might want to buckle up, baby. Some advice. We assume everyone will betray you, and you will never be disappointed. I got a really good feeling about this. Since when do you know how to fly? 190 years old? You look great. Push it! a little bit about Rogue One. I've just dropped myself in boiling hot water like a lobster, but uh, <laughs> Rogue One was the first Star Wars story, and next week we've got the second Star Wars story, Solo, a Star Wars story. It would be remiss of me not to ask you, Dave, what are your hopes for Solo? What are you, what are you anticipating? What are you looking forward to? Well, it's kind of a bit of a, a strange one, and to kind of like explain, I mean, I, I'm, I'm like really optimistic about Solo. From the point of view of, I loved Rogue One because it didn't follow necessarily, although although it kind of leads into something that we're all familiar with. It was a storyline that was completely separate and didn't have to kind of fit in with what we know and love as as like this ongoing like mythology and fairy tale. Solo is kind of in that same sort of territory. It's got yeah. reference and signposts to things that we're familiar with uh, in the form of the characters with like uh, Han and like Lando, but it doesn't have to follow a specific path or route that ties in with everything else. I think it is going to be really good because it's refreshingly different. Yeah, exactly. Do you get the sense then that the Star Wars story movies are going to be at a deep dive a little bit more than the saga? Because the sagas are kind of on a pathway, aren't they? It's the Skywalker story. Yeah. And, you know. Well, well, the the Last Jedi coming off the back of Last Jedi, it was very much a fifty fifty thing in terms of the overall reaction to it is how it feels. And yeah. and just to explain for anybody who has never crossed paths with before with myself, I run a toy shop. So I for, for a living I sell toys. Uh, I live the dream and I sell Star Wars stuff. And then I also live the nightmare and I have to sell things like My Little Pony. And don't, you know. don't give me that. You love that pony stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen the video. But, 
But like exactly. So, but I, but I sell toys for a living. So my my level of exposure and uh, interaction is different from maybe like the casual fan. So I I'm seeing very much a reaction to how people take to pop culture things. You know, and and a lot of toys are very much pop culture led these days. You know, there is always like a film tie in, and the whole toy industry is very much like a McDonald's Happy Meal. Uh, <laughs> yeah. you, you got a specific window of opportunity and then it's out and then you get the next thing in and then you might get a second blip where you got like the home release with like dvd and blu-rays and things like that but like for the most part it's all got to happen within a very specific set period of time solo's condensed and it like almost crashes in at the point where last jedi has its like home release so there's not like a bit of breathing space but also where there was kind of like a bit of a lukewarm reception to the product that was released to Last Jedi. Yeah. Coming off the back of a, a, a sort of a 50-50 kind of like, I'm not sure how I feel about this. Do I like it? Don't I like it? It kind of waters down at a retailer's level. It feels like it's watered down Star Wars a little bit. Yeah. And, and not in a bad way, not in a good, but like it's it's not like a buzz. So we don't have the buzz that we've got going into Solo. But I think you do have a lot more opportunity for expansion and exploration. I haven't read, I'm not really like a, a guy who's read tons of comics and, and, and all of the expanded universe, but I really love the Rogue Squadron novels that I read 20 odd years ago. Um, they were really cool because I like the idea of the adventures of this team of people that go on to like do great things yeah but, like it's very much the nitty-gritty day-to-day living of and I, th- I think the tagline they had back then was like taking back one planet at a time kind of yeah. thing and it's, it's it's very true because you're seeing like the broader strokes of things of like bang you know because it's like following like the, the main characters but i like the ideas of like all the, like, these side stories and like star wars tales were always great as well yes, absolutely, you know yeah. I, I think you can kind of really do more to fill out that side of things than put in all your hopes and dreams and fears because like you can never ever meet the expectation now no. given social media of like the core characters people will say oh isn't it sad that there was no Harrison Carrie and Mark scene you know them all together and isn't it that wasn't very good or this was too good or that was a repeat of what we had with a new hope and it's like you just can't win you literally cannot win could you imagine Facebook being around when the Phantom Menace that's yeah I mean god can you yeah Yeah, really all those trans AOL transatlantic chat rooms just collapsing in on themselves yeah Uh, yeah yeah Yeah, exactly Exactly. what (laughs) Uh, and and the number of uh, Jar Jar gifts and things like that like that level that is set you just cannot at an entertainment level at a at a as someone who sells the stuff for a living it's very difficult to like ever meet the expectations of things yeah. so rogue one was really cool because it was familiar but not familiar at the same time yeah uh, it wasn't really so much a kid's film this i'm not so sure at if, if it will be kind of like what age group it will be pitched at but i think it'll be cool because it doesn't follow things that we've got so much invested in other than the fact that obviously it's not harrison ford playing han solo yeah. but i don't think that's a bad thing either because again we don't assume anymore that ewan mcgregor isn't alec guinness you know we, we we've accepted True. that and and we've moved on and with the news recently of like the kenobi movie going forward everybody's like crying for ewan mcgregor to like step back into those shoes so that is a clear example with that we can see beyond those original cast characters being played by someone else. I don't think it's actually a bad thing. No. And by opening that up, you're not limiting what you can do either. So, um, you know, you're opening up those constraints. So I think, I think it's a cool thing. And then if it means that further on down the line, there's more Han Solo movies or there's like a Lando spin-off, you know, there's an awful lot of good buzz uh, surrounding like Donald Glover, it seems. Yeah, true. Uh, and then go beyond there, like Lobot the movie, <laughs> um, and Max Rebo the movie, yeah. and Zuvio. Oh, how could I not say Zuvio? We've because seen the really, trailer. We've seen the trailer for Zuvio. Zu- oh, of course it's coming, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, 2022. Someone's got to keep all the people on Jakku in line. He's the man, and he was only two weeks from retirement. <laughs> 
I'm too old for this poodoo. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's called out retirement for one last time. <laughs> you could have Zuvio three, two, three, four, five, you know, and just like literally carry it on. And then becomes a TV series. Zuvio happen. Academy or something like that. <laughs> Mission to Moscow. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, see, I hope uh, the guys from the uh, storyboard groups are listening to this. Uh, <laughs> oh yeah, I'm sure they're all tuning in. <laughs> we'll, we'll give you that one for free. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You can take that one. Please take that one. Please take that one. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I think I think Solo is going to be good fun. I'm looking forward to seeing somebody else have a crack at playing a young Han Solo because you've just alluded to it. We've got this emotional connection to Mark and Harrison and Carrie and, and the, the original actors that played the roles. But you're talking three decades since they were the age that we kind of want to see these new stories set in, so they can't do it. And CG's not at the stage where it can duplicate them or replicate them, and, and it shouldn't. I'd rather see a new actor in that role. So it's it's going to come. You'll have a new actor play Luke at some stage. You'll have a new actress play Leia at some stage. We've now got a new Han Solo, we've got a new Lando. I think it's great. I, I want to see the stories. And I think one thing I'd love to see, and I don't think it's beyond the bounds of possibility that the story group would go there. And, and it's the same with Indiana Jones. I think when they cast a new Indy, which they will at some point, there's no reason at all why they couldn't tell stories, for example, between Raiders and Last Crusade, that three-year stretch, with another actor, other actresses, and other act- older actors playing familiar characters, another Marcus Brody, and so on and so forth. And it's all the same reality. It's just yeah. an actor. You know, but it's the same story. They're not stepping on any toes. It's, it's continuing that story. They could do the same with Star Wars. They could tell a story between... Um, Star Wars and Empire, you know, about finding yeah. the Hoth Bay. Oh, I don't know. There's loads of options. It, they could go well, there if they it, wanted. It's like James Bond, isn't it? You have your version of that character that you're, is particularly a favourite, uh, yeah. be it because it's your era or, you know, you think that that actor is better performer in that. But, yeah. like, you never see the kind of online social revolt, you know, a James Bond character. Oh, I'm not going to see this because it's not my James Bond and all this. And it's like, oh, for crying out loud, you know. Yeah. Don't be ridiculous. Yeah. I actually had uh, a friend and customer, uh, another Mark, pop in today, and he he was talking about Solo coming out next week and the anticipation for it. But he did say nobody hates Star Wars films quite like Star Wars fans. Very true. I thought that was quite clever. (laughs) That is so true. (laughs) It's like, yeah, Yeah, you kind of got a point there. Yeah, Um, we we do tend to self-implode in that respect. Yeah, but it's it's just like James Bond, you know, and Doctor Who. Crying yes, out loud, you know. True. Look at you know. There, there, there's there's plenty of other things that are out there that are the same characters that are that they have to bring in new versions of. Don't write it off. Yeah. Sit back, see it, and then draw conclusions. And and some of it you might be presently surprised, and some of it you might be like, mm. in this sense, I get that you are retrospectively moving towards a character that you're familiar with. Yeah. But like you said, for things like Indiana Jones and things like that, you know, I, I think making the Dread Pirate Roberts, you know, it, it's someone <laughs> who ha- just has the title could always move into that. Yeah. Well, Indy was given the hat, wasn't he? He kind of inherited the whip. So, you know, it makes yeah. sense for Indy. Hot dang! This is Darth Elvis from Darth Elvis and the Imperials here with an exclusive first play just on the Phantom Tracks Network, baby, of our new song, Yak Face. This is going to be on our next album, which will be out later this year. I hope you all come out to some of our shows over the summer. Check us out at darkvelvis.co.uk and give us a follow on Facebook and Twitter. And whilst I'm here, I'm proud to be a part of the Pamper Tracks family. Let me tell you, make sure you subscribe to the YouTube channel. Follow us on Facebook and on Twitter, Instagram, and check out the website, pampertracks.com, baby. And I'm going to go and hang up my brother now, Constable Zuvio down in Jakku. We're going to have a few drinks and give Uncle Plot a wedgie. Hang loose, baby. Speak to you soon.
one of the things that we are going to come to in a few minutes is some of the interviews that we did at Dave Prowse's last ever convention, which was down down London Way, near Heathrow. Cracking weekend, one day event. It was an old school 90s style event. I know you're very sort of fond of that because that's the spirit you kind of go for with Fire This Run. What, what are your recollections of sort of convention times back in the 90s? Again, for anybody who doesn't know, who's never met me, and there's millions of people. <laughs> Well, I, I, I run a, what is effectively a love letter to the um, early conventions of the 1990s, uh, a show called Fathers From. The idea behind it is that it is all the toys and memorabilia related to the original trilogy from the late 70s and the early 80s. And we run it three times a year, uh, opposite where I, I, I run the shop. And now we've expanded that into Fanfa Day as well. So yeah. we have uh, a Fanfa Tracks dedicated family day, which is just full of craziness and all kinds of like activities and games. And then we, the following day, we have like the retro toy show. But part of my discovery back into Star Wars, and I think it's fair to say that most people kind of go through a similar kind of rite of passage that you, you're into these things. And then like, you know, either other things like be it another toy line or other interests like, you know, take your fancy and then you get to a point into your teenage years and then all of a sudden beer girls everything you know everything Uh, but what that like kind of takes over and then there's a rediscovery of these things now for me now uh, and i've i've talked about this a lot with other people my nostalgia isn't actually necessarily about the original times within star wars my nostalgia is also the period of time that I then rediscovered yes. and got back into it. So it's a, a phrase of like sort of like the sort of dark times of, of like collecting before you had the re-release probably of Hasbro Ken and action figures in, in 1995. Yeah. Anything before that is kind of considered a bit in the wilderness. But for me, I was at university in the early 90s, uh, college and university, and I used to have to catch a bus via Salisbury, which is 10 miles north of here. And there used to be a little comic shop, and I used to go in there, and he had a little bucket full of, like, loose Star Wars figures. And I started buying Dark Empire. I was then looking at the Star Wars figures. Oh, I didn't, didn't have that one. Look at that. Oh, you know, and then sort of, like, you know, seeing the West End games. And it was those things that kind of, like, literally slowly drew me back in. And then I remember for my 18th birthday, I got X-Wing. Um, PC game and I also got like the player manual as well and the player manual had all of this incredible information in there all about the different uh, history or the ships and stuff like that and it's kind of what and then like someone explained to me well no that's all from like West End Games you know they put that in there and so I was then suckered into bits and pieces and I've even got I've still got it says scrapbook of anything that was Star Wars related back then that was in the media now like you just open up anything and there's something Star Wars related. Very but back true. then, I've got like this horrific 90s scrapbook of like any kind of like newspaper <laughs> cuttings and stuff like that. That's the sort of stuff I love. But in this comic shop, there was a little flyer from the Falcon Society about one of their Star Wars gatherings. And I went up to Chestnut with my mate, who I studied with, James. And all of a sudden, you're in a room with 200 other people which is nothing by today's standards. But back then, it was a big deal that all of a sudden, you're not, like, on your own anymore. And, like, there's all these other people that are into exactly the same thing that you are. And it's in a dingy, sort of dark church kind of thing. A little bit musty smelling. uh, But there's tons of, like, all toys and things like that. And you're like, oh, my God, this is heaven. And then you might have a couple of the guests. And they were great because back then... It was only four pounds for a signature because it was two pounds for the signing and two pounds for the photograph. But you, you literally got one on one FaceTime with all like, these people. That, that's the other thing. It was still relatively fresh in their minds as well because you're only talking about, you know, less than 10 years. Yeah. In some cases, you know, uh, it, 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 well, it wasn't even 10 years uh, in, in some cases for like Jedi. But they're literally happy to talk about all these things and then you're getting like the skinny on deleted scenes or yeah. that you didn't even know existed you know they're talking about like filming stuff that never got put in the film and again to try and put this in context you only had the vhs tapes at this point you didn't have like all these documentaries and like deleted extras and things like that that you have now it was just like, oh. so this was like gold dust and getting to meet like the original jab of the hut and you're like what 
<laughs> you know, <laughs> what are you talking about? You know, and he's like this big burly guy, you know, with a strong Irish accent. You'd absolutely nail it, Mark. But uh, like, I don't do Irish accents. You know, it was it was just like Anymore. phenomenal. So for me, like farthest from getting back to like what you asked. Yeah, <laughs> it's literally a love letter to those times because to me that nostalgia now, the '90s in particular, yeah. hold a huge amount of nostalgia as a Star Wars fan that you will never get back ever again. It, it's very much underrated at the moment, but you will never see anything quite like it again. And also the sales of them you will never quite see quite again because as mainstream mass market as Star Wars is now, the few products that were available then, certainly by the time of the special editions, there were nowhere near the number of licenses that you have now. So the sales of those toys at that point far, far outstrip the sales of the toys that you've got now. You know, it, it, they, they, they would absolutely kill to have those kind of sales figures again. You know, some people look down their noses at the products that were produced and things like that, but they're indicative of their time, and I've, I've, I've got a real place in my heart on them. I totally agree. Totally agree. I think that the 90s as an, an era for Star Wars is is very much underrated because, as you say, we all remember the sort of the Beatlemania of the original trilogy, and then... Uh, you know, the, the Saturday morning stuff and the Ewok movies and then it going a bit quiet yeah. for a few years, you know, the, the much, you know, sort of lauded dark times. But like you're saying, once you got to Dark Empire, Air to the Empire, sort of 91, 92, uh, you know, it all starts to pick up and start kicking off again, Sans Sweet's book, and people start reading all these things. And, and like you say, by 95, when Hasbro got the license, it just went crazy, didn't it? Let's give props where props need to be given. None of this would have been would have happened without Bendems. Yeah, you have a very soft spot for Bendems, which could be taken the wrong way. Um, <laughs> you, you've got you've got, you've got all sorts of Bendem stuff, haven't you? <laughs> oh, cheers. <laughs> okay. Yeah, no, I I, I absolutely love Bendems. They're, they're the first thing to always be run down. True. Power of the Force two figures are the second things always to be run down. But it is a pure example of rose tinted spectacles because Bendems are going to look terrible when you make anything out of rubber and then coat it in an elastic paint that won't crack. Um, you lose all definition and detail. You know, they are what they are. Power of the Force 2 figures are big, muscly, bulky. But then if you look at the best-selling figures for that period of time, which were like, all like the Toy Biz, yeah. um, X-Men, you know, Marvel figures, Spawn, yeah. uh, Farland Toys, um, even like G.I. Joe and G.I. Joe Extreme and things like that, they were all big, muscly you know, ridiculously posed action figures. That's that's what the market wanted back then. You can't tell me that the original vintage Chewbacca actually looks like Chewbacca and that Han Solo's neck is that thick on, you know, the Han Solo in Carbonite figure. You know, it's like, no, you're looking at them because you're fond of them, but they weren't necessarily great figures or, or no better or no worse than what was produced in the 90s. But... <laughs> Yeah, things really exploded for certain toy companies in that era. What you kind of got to remember as well is Kenner, who were the original producers of the Star Wars line, they were acquired by Hasbro in the early 90s, and there was like this whole period of integration of two toy companies and um, trying to find the feet of like who takes care of what. Do Kenner do the boys' toy side of things? Do they, you know, take care of some of the Hasbro properties and, and sort of vice versa? So it was a, it was a very much a, a problematic and difficult era for that company and, and also like relocating and, and Star Wars kind of not so much solved that problem, but certainly went a long way. You know, we, we got like a demand of, of, of things like kicking in there and you you know you had other big popular lines you know like batman animated was a huge uh yeah. like back then for uh kenner it certainly kind of helped a little bit to like sort of get things merging towards you know that 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 sort of a full full integration there yeah, yeah. no it's huge it's huge i think <laughs> we should be i think we need another podcast of sorts I, yeah about sort of you're inspiring me i think we should we should start thinking about a collecting podcast maybe and talk about the old days but let's let's come back to what we're doing now we've got an yes. interview from dave prowse's last ever convention which is very cool like i say old school style Dave was signing in a side room, but all the other guests were there in the one room. We've got a couple more interviews from this event coming up on the next couple of shows, uh, but we had a cracking time whilst we were there, and this is an interview we did with Empire Strikes Back Assistant Director Bill Wesley, who is, as you'll hear, a bit of a character. 
Tell us a little bit about what you did on the film, just for people who don't know. Well, on this particular one, The Empire yeah. Strikes yeah. Back. That's yeah. all I worked on, The yeah. Empire. Well, a very good friend of mine, Peter MacDonald, he was the director of it, of the second unit, yeah. who was employed, obviously, by Kirshner, of Kirshner. And Peter asked me, would I like to come out to Norway for him? Me being me, I said, yeah, OK. We had to go into Elstree and see the first Star Wars. And to be honest, I couldn't make head or tail of it because there was little things running around, weep, weep, squeaking and all that yeah, sort of. Yeah. But I said to Pete, Pete, it's great fun, but will we have any actors? He said, we will, Bill. We'll have 400 Norwegian soldiers right. up in the thing, hence here, up this fence, picture yeah. here, up in Fence. And, of course, me, I can't speak English, let alone Norwegian. <laughs> so I'm telling them to shoot yeah, yeah. the guns and all that sort of thing. And uh, I mean... What can I say? It was like a schoolboy's adventure. Yeah. It was wonderful. It really was. We all lived together. We were only supposed to have been there for about nine days, I think. Right. But we kept getting snowed out and things like that. The yeah. idea was was to get a, a, a picture from the top of the mountain looking yeah. right across into Russia. Right. Which would look like the moon service. <laughs> but we could never get that. George Lucas would say, sit on it, sit on it, try and get it, try and get it. So he was giving you permission so, to stay out there? Oh, yeah, yeah. So yeah. we stayed out there for about six or seven weeks. Wow. I think it was about six. Wasn't it? But he would have left us out there. But, you know, to get yeah, the picture sure, that he yeah. wanted, we could hear the helicopters every morning lowering these big bags for us with all our camera gear in yeah. to get it. But it was always snowed out. We'd have whiteouts. Yeah. So in the end, this place we stayed at, yeah. <coughs> that's a railway station. Right, it's not yeah. a hotel. It's a railway station. <laughs> and But it was booked out in the Easter time, I think it was, yeah. for the uh, skiers. Right, all the yeah. skiers. So we had to come home. Yeah. So we didn't... We didn't yeah, how did they that, get the shot? Did they do like a map painting? Or, or? They, yeah, was, see, I mustn't tell you anything. I don't know how they got it. I'm going to sure. say I don't honestly... I know that Peter and I would have loved to have gone out and got the shot yeah. because it's disappointed not to get something that you really wanted, sure. you know. And George and Gary Kurtz, yeah. they looked after us like absolute chat. They sent us the latest films out to show us on videos and all yeah, that. Yeah. They really looked at it. It was a schoolboy's adventure. We've had, I've done a lot of films, as you can see. Sure. But this one will go down... I suppose my second one would be the commitment, which I had great fun right, on. Yeah. But this one was a schoolboy's adventure. It really was. So when, when, are you, when are you in a situation like that and the weather's against you, you've got work to do, and obviously you have to make compromises to get the shots. We're absolutely. Yeah. You know, yeah, we have to. Are you just constantly uh, working around the problem? Are you just figuring out alternatives? Giving alternatives to try to, to give Kirsch, yeah. send it back to London, yeah. let Kirsch see it on the right, yeah. and he'll say, yeah, yeah, Pete, I can use that, and whatever. Yeah. In fact, Pete, I think anything we shot was used. Wow. Even the aerial stuff from the thing. All, yeah. all Peter McDonald stuff was so good. Kirsch was, at, well, everybody was over the moon with, Kirsch, with Pete McDonald stuff. Yeah. I'm very surprised that I haven't seen Peter at any of these. I really am. In fact, I will phone him up and say yeah. why. Because I am in here, her husband, my best mate, Mike Roberts, he won the BAFTA Award, you know, nice. for the thing with Chris Menges. Yeah. And she talked me into doing it. This is only second time I've been here. Really? To do one, to do this sort of thing. So yeah, really mean, obviously you had a long career, you did a lot yeah. of things. Yeah. But obviously this is, is a, a good memory. Like I say, boys stay out. Are you yeah. enjoying doing this now? Yeah, oh, today has been honestly and truly. I done one in Birmingham with Eileen yeah. a couple of weeks. That was great fun. Yeah. But this has been. Because Dave, I knew Dave a yeah. long, long. I knew Dave when he won his gold medal right. for weightlifting. Okay, you know. Then he became a stunt man. All that, and I'm so glad that they've done this for him. Yeah, I really am. Yeah. You know, it's been. So we'll be seeing you out here a bit, little bit more. I think so. If Jason, want, you know, I don't know how how these things were. I don't oh. honestly and truly know. I leave it all to Eileen here because she's done it. She's yeah. done it for a long time. She was in the Star Wars. And yeah. it's a character sort of thing, yeah. you know. Yeah. And yeah, we've been friends for years. Yeah. She's travelled the world well with me because of her husband, for Mike. And me and Mike were great buddies, yeah. you know. Yeah. We lost him, what, four years ago. But uh, we were great buddies. And Mike, Eileen and my wife, and we travelled the world together. Yeah. So, you know, parties with Paul Newman. Wow. Come to my wife's 60th birthday party. Yeah, yeah. And all that. Oh, yeah. Morgan, Morgan Freeman. I've yeah. done his first picture. 
All right. He used to phone Clint Eastwood up every night. Clint, I'm in trouble. What do I do here? And Clint, would, I could hear Clint. That I'll spill here, I'll tell you. <laughs> no, I'm not joking. You know, That's all good. You it's wind me up. I, can, I love it, honestly and truly. When I was working, I very rarely spoke about it because I found that he's either boasting or he's what's yeah. he talking about? No one would believe me. You know what I mean? But now I thoroughly enjoy it. To people who know yeah. and it you know I've been in Air Force One I can't tell that to anyone can I no. <laughs> really when Bruce Willis phoned up Bill sent to Bill Clinton yeah it's true but don't you oh for God <laughs> don't worry about that I, I can edit I only want yeah, the Star Wars no, stuff don't you yeah. Yeah. <laughs> don't worry, I'm, I'm, I'm just, friends with Bill don't worry it's alright oh. <laughs> don't worry about me so on, on one of them, I did get trapped and I forgot about it, but the BBC put a thing around my waist yeah. and I forgot all about it. You didn't I, get to the toilet and all that No, stuff, but I was in Thailand doing a picture of the killing fields. <laughs> and the kids, the kids, they had to all flew up when I set the bombs off sure. and all that. But they was walking into a danger zone, yeah. but they heard a bomb go on the ground just like that. So they all fell over. Of course, I went mad. It took me three hours to set the shot up. So I went, you? Oh, I went... Uh, and it costs it all on that. Oh, okay. <laughs> so you're the guy in the outtakes Ooh. video, are you? Some of them, yeah. Some so, of them. So to wrap and it up her then. old man standing there laughing his head off because he knew he had it on. <laughs> and he, he's more or less winding me up. You know, go on, Bill, have a go. Like, poke, 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 poke. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> what, what's your abiding memory of Empire? Obviously, you say boys stay out, a good laugh. But is that, is that the big memory you take away from no, it? No, I can tell you one, really, one I'll always remember is two little old ladies, and I mean old ladies, and they had a skidoo with a sledge on the back, yeah. and no matter where we were on that mountain, they would always turn up mm-hmm. 10 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 4 o'clock with tea and hot soup. The tea was for me, That's my kind and of the hot thing. soup was for the crew. Wow. And I'll never forget them two and old she ladies. And milk two sugars sort of thing. She knew what you wanted. Oh, yes. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And Phil Kohler, who was our location manager, I used to talk, I said, Phil, where's the tea? Where's the tea? And when I was, on the last day of the picture, Phil came up. He said, Bill, I've got the tea for you. And he chucked a bucket of cold water over <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, I do have some great memories. I really do. And that one, you know, I, and never cold. It was 27 degrees below at some time. And I never felt cold. George Lucas gave us everything. Yeah, yeah. Or Gary Kurtz gave us yeah. everything, clothes wires, thermals, all that. And smoke, I used to smoke in them days. Smoke. We used to get icicles on the end of your nose. <laughs> Truly. Yeah, honestly. It's right to have a pee. Yeah. Yeah, in case it froze. <laughs> <laughs> and we have one lady, one lady on the picture. George Kurtz. Uh, Earth Kirshner came out for the first few days and then left it all for us a second. We had one girl, Pam, her name was Pam, and she was continuity. And we had <coughs> one man that used to look all like snow cats. Yeah. And he used to build Pam a little igloo every day so she could go. To. Yeah. So, of course, we used to torment the life out of Pam every time she walked, we you know where you go. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the sort of fun the picture yeah. was, yeah. you know. It was great all the time. It was brilliant. Yeah, was brilliant. you wouldn't have got through it if it was serious at minus 27, would <laughs> no, you? No, 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 exactly. No, I don't. Yeah. And I think, I think Gary, well, Gary was with us all the time. Yeah. Because Gary used to love taking photographs. photographs yeah, yeah. 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 And we never went short on that. In the evenings, they used to send over from America films before videos. We never yeah, yeah. got a couple of videos, but they'd be on 16 mil. Yeah. And we'd show them down the end of the this. Ra- this is a railway station, yeah, yeah. not a hotel. Yeah. And we had our own area down the bottom. It had a bar in it, and we used to show films down. There. They looked after us. Yeah. It's, you know, it's it was making memories. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> and when I come to this, I say this is the second one I've been to. It, Fetches it all back, I was say, you know, yeah. with someone, like I've seen the geezer down the end there, yeah. Mike, uh, Mike Stevens, yeah. well he was a stunt double for Patrick McNee in the Avengers. Right. Now I haven't seen him, must be 50 years. Wow. Because I was Diana Riggs stunt double. So me and him <laughs> knew each yeah, other. Really? How did that work? <laughs> wow. Hey, I see the picture. There's the picture. Wow. <laughs> That is very disturbing. So I can tell some stories. (laughs) 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 No, you know, Dave, as I just told you, Dave, I knew Dave when he won his medal. Yeah, yeah. And I knew him as a stump man. And as you know, he's not. 
sort of got, you know. Yeah. But it was great to see it. Yeah. That sort of thing. It just fetches it all back. Just well, we'll be it. sure to seek you at next I'll event know. you're at. We'll, we'll make sure to come over and bug you again. Well. Get some more nuggets of gold out here. Oh, I could tell some stories. <laughs> <laughs> One of the sequel stars was Katie Cartwheel. She played Hugh in 327 in The Force Awakens. That's that great big red droid that you see walking away from Maz's castle when Han and Finn... So and cool. Such a cool-looking droid. She was also a caretaker in The Last Jedi. And oh, nice. we had the chance to sit down with Katie at Star Wars Fan Fun Day in Burnley, which we only did last weekend, which seems like donkeys ago already, but it was only last weekend. And uh, we had a chat with Katie. So here's our little chat. <laughs> We're at Star Wars Fan Fun Day in Burnley. We are. We're looking out on a lovely pitch. It's beautiful. If only my back wasn't constantly turned towards it. Yeah, you've got that all wrong. You should turn your table around. I should. I'm going to turn around more often. Ah, you should. That's yeah, better. Yeah. Isn't that nice? Ah. It's not nice to me. I'm a West Brom fan. We're getting relegated. But, but for what it is, it's very nice. Mm. Now, is this your first Fan Fun Day in Burnley? Yes. How this is my, it? not only my first one in Burnley, yeah. my first ever one. First ever so convention. My first ever convention. Wow, well, we, we've got a lot of firsts today. Yeah, there's a lot of firsts going on. <laughs> exactly. Are you enjoying it? Um, yeah, I'm really enjoying it. Well, I was lucky enough to have dinner with um, some of the organisers yeah. and diehard fans last night. Yeah. Um, so I, I got to meet people and they were all like, for a first convention, I'm really lucky. Yeah. Because it's a real family um, in, um, atmosphere yeah. and everyone's very friendly and sociable. And quite different, I think, from sort of larger conventions, I've heard. It depends. This one, and I'm not just saying this because we're here, this is this is considered one of the friendliest, yeah. most welcoming conventions. I know a lot of the UK crowd rank, rank this above even celebration because wow. it's so friendly and easygoing and you can just come up and talk to folks like yourself and yeah. it's just easy. So people like this show. So actually, it's a really good one for me to start off with yeah. because I can learn how to do it, yeah. how to sign, what to ask. Yeah. You know, how, what people expect yeah. in a friendly environment. So <laughs> when I get thrown to the wolves in a larger event, totally. um, I'm not going to be totally lost. <laughs> oh, for you. So thank you, thank you, Burnley. And again, over. Yeah. So you're enjoying it so far. So what were your expectations? Because if you've not done it before, you don't yeah. really know what you're going into, do That's you? That's right. I didn't have any expectations yeah. at all. Um, because um, obviously working on Star Wars, yeah. doing creature work, yeah, yeah. it's all about not expecting anything and going in with a totally open mind because really? whenever you go into work yeah. um, you, anything could happen they could say I'll oh, come in for a fitting but then suddenly um, you're rehearsing yeah. or it's uh, pop in for an hour suddenly you're doing a full day's work yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and then doing a show and tell to the director yeah. so the whole nature of the job is, is, is coming in expecting and not expecting, expecting anything it. expecting nothing you yeah. could go in and they say oh actually this isn't ready uh, you'll have to go home now yeah. You know, so you could you spend loads of time psyching yourself up for yeah. something that doesn't happen. Yeah. How exhausting is that? So, because like you say, if, if you're going in all queued yeah. up to do something, then it's like, oh, we don't, we don't need you today. What's that like? Well, that's, oh, it's, it's horrendous. Yeah, it's not good at all. No. <laughs> sometimes, like, sometimes it's all right. Yeah. Like, sometimes, if I'm doing work inside a suit, yeah, it's going to be a uh, lack of air, yeah. lack of vision. So I'll do lots of breathing exercises on the way in. Yeah. Maybe talk myself through a meditation thing. Yeah. You know, to get my, my mind in the right place to yeah. kind of go under. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> but so that I'm in a relaxed state of mind. I get that. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so if I've done that, and then I arrive to work, and they go, oh, actually, you're on standby, I'm like, well, I feel really, really nice and peaceful now. Yeah. So I've just got a nice vibe for the whole day. Yeah. So that sort of preparation is fine. I can handle that. <laughs> yeah. And well, what was your preparation for this? Oh, for the convention. For this convention. I Being prepared. I just prepared what I was going to wear. Yeah. Um, you look fantastic. So you prepared well. Yeah. No, because I was like, right, I've got a dinner, smart cash. Yeah. I thought, right, I need an outfit for dinner. I need an outfit for signing. Yeah. I've got my little sham. Yes, I saw that. Oh, that I bought in Ireland when yeah. we were shooting Last Jedi. Never. Nice. Yeah. And because I bought three of them at the airport. And I gave the other two, one to Mark Jones, yeah. who's a fabricator in the creatures department, yeah. and one to Becky Sims, okay. who's also a fabricator in the creatures Because I worked with them really closely yeah. in Ireland, and yeah. they really looked after me. Okay. And we just got on like a house on fire. So like, we've all got this little shamrock pin. Shamrock club. Yeah. So that's all I did to prepare. I, I prepared a signature as oh, well. Well, there's a question, you see. Yeah. 
how did you prepare? Because some people have got these fantastic signatures. My 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 signature's lame. So if I ever became famous, I would hmm. have to work out something totally you would. new. How did you find that? Or do well, you have an interesting signature? You know, it is up to you, isn't it? You can yeah. just have, just write something yeah. normally and not worry about it. It depends on your personality. That's true. Do you want to go a bit of pizzazz? Yeah, yeah. So I went for the pizzazz version. Yeah. Um, with a flourish. With a flourish. <laughs> well, because my, my name's Katie Cartwheel. Yeah, yeah. Which is a um, cool name, yeah. as you said. In, in the entertainment world. I know. Yeah. Yes. So my signature is KK. Yeah. And then we, yeah. Basically. Yeah. And it goes up in a. Because it is. That's what it's doing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a cartwheel. Yeah. So that is how it looks. You're the most kinetic signature in Star Wars fan. In While Star I'm Wars. writing that signature, I am cartwheeling in my mind. <laughs> now, in The Last Jedi, you mentioned Ireland. Mm. You were a caretaker. Yes. Not many cartwheels for the caretakers, I assume. No, I did try and get them to put them in. Now, when yeah. we were rehearsing, I spoke to Paul Casey and I said, come on. Yeah. You know, how about we try a cartwheel in this in this character? And I can give it a go with a head and with a... And then Paul Casey was like... I don't really think this character would cartwheel, would it? Um, and um, he's right. We're nuns, you know. We're nuns. I got to do a bit of raking. That's good raking, too. I raked. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I raked up some stones. I was raking. To be honest, the rake didn't actually work because, well, the, the wood on the rake is so far apart. It's a fake rake. It's a fake rake. Yeah, that's not good. Yeah, a mistake. A mistake, fake rake. <laughs> So you must have been thrilled. I mean, obviously doing Force Awakens, which was awesome, and that's such a cool character. Yeah. And then coming back and doing Last Jedi, a completely different character. It's always nice to do totally oh, different absolutely. things. Oh, absolutely. Was that? Did it meet your expectations? Gosh, I mean, after doing um, Big Red, otherwise known as Hero Red Three Two Seven, I mean, that was so hard. Up on stilts of balancing, going into a caretaker was like, oh my gosh, my feet are on the floor. Yes. So I was just in heaven. Right, and yeah. yes, I was really hot, and it was heavy, and yeah. Yeah. but I was like, actually, compared to Big Red, this is a walk in the park. This is fine. And were you so I really, I really appreciated the experience because yeah. I knew um, how hard it can be in a really big, heavy character. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And although it is very hard inside a caretaker, yeah. it it wasn't as hard because your actual feet were on. Because the floor. my feet were on the floor. Yeah, yeah. Um, and. Um, you could kind of move my own body around. It wasn't so much around. Okay, uh, with, with Big Red, it was pushing levers inside the upper shell, um, you know, picking up the legs in a certain way, very robot-like. The caretakers, I was thinking about the character and how it moved, but it was more lively and energetic and perhaps a bit more like my character. So I, get, I got to put a little bit of me in there, which was nice. Awesome. So you were pleased? You were pleased with how it came out, all the stuff that you saw, you were happy with everything? Oh, I was really happy that um, my caretaker made it into the film. Like, because, you know, there yeah. was... Because uh, our big scene was cut. Was that the Dance of the Village scene? That's correct, where all the caretakers are dancing around the fight. Yeah. And Ray comes in with a lightsaber. Yeah. And it was so fun to shoot it. Um, it a and lot of fun on the action. I know, and that big... I mean, the fact that got cut from the movie, I found, was really upsetting. Yeah. Um, is it true that Ryan's a fan of folk music and that's why that went in? Oh, I didn't, I, I didn't know that. I heard that he loves, he genuinely loves folk music. Right. He's like, he wanted a folk scene in there. It's just kind of a yeah. cool little thing, isn't it? Oh, yeah, I know. And then he took it, took it out because it was too distracting uh, from like the main dialogue. Yeah. And actually, when I watched The Last Jedi, I've got to agree because I think those intense moments of silence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, where Ray's really finding herself. Worked really well. It makes the film, yeah, so yeah. I think he did the right thing to yeah. take it out. I'm so glad that it surfaced because yes. it was too good just to loop. Yeah. But I was really happy that yeah, my caretaker with the rake made it, made it because I was watching it going, will I make it? Will I make it? And I did, and I was like, yes. so you have a future in gardening shows now. That's what it is. Oh my gosh, I do. You could do it, spin it off. I do, but I wouldn't use that rake. <laughs> it, rake. it doesn't work. <laughs> the mistake <laughs> of a fake rake, rake yeah. does not. Yeah. Hashtag. <laughs> um, we've got to get that going. Totally got it. Brilliant. I'll let you carry on because it's a busy day. But right. thank you for your time. Thanks so much, Mark. I'll speak again soon. All right. Take care. So what a nice lady. I'd spoke to her before, but never met her, never put a face to the name. So it was nice to actually sit, sit down and have a proper chat. To put all that into context, I mean, you're talking very, very brief moments, but the way that they're done, they're iconic in themselves. I mean, she, she even featured on the, um, the Royal Mail stamp. Uh, that Malcolm Tween did. The moment you explain 
what that character is like. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about because it's just so cool and that. So being able to like pull that off as a what would you call it a suit on stilts or yeah, or an I think outfit. it was. It was yeah, it was it was. She was kind of wearing it, but she, because she was circus trained, I think she was quite comfortable with the stilt aspect of it. So she uh, took a bit of work, but she was she was showing people at Fan Fun Day kind of how she perambulated and how she got the movement going and such. And she's not very tall. She's probably only. I'd say four foot ten. I would guess she's not tall at all. Honestly. Everyone compared to you is not tall. I do, yeah, it's probably an unfair comparison, isn't it? <laughs> but, but she was she was so cool and she was like talking to everybody. And that's that's one of the nice things about Star Wars Fan Fun Day is that you can go up and talk to Guy Henry and have a chat with him or have a beer with him at, at dinner with the stars or whatever it might be, you know, and just go and have a have a, a catch up with other fans. And it's a, it's a very uh, it's a cool event to go to. And we've got next episode some more audio coming from Fan Fun Day. So that's not the last that you'll hear. It's Tuesday night. Time to get all your Star Wars news in a single file. Welcome to Making Tracks. That's a wrap for the first episode. Thanks, Dave, for being our co-host. No, thank you for inviting me. Um, it's very exciting. If ever you should need us, yes. you know, I, I don't have to be the last one you can call on. Okay. Um, I, I am here. I was trying to remember the lines from... Um, labyrinth at the end and i've completely failed <laughs> I can't yes remember either. should you need us <laughs> <laughs> at least labyrinth has got a little bit of uh, kudos to it like, no, not say, there's a nice there's kind of a lucas connection with labyrinth isn't there so, so we, can, we can get away with that one. hell yeah so uh where can people find you dave if they want to find you well i am a denizen of a small toy shop on the edge of the New Forest in Hampshire called All the Cool Stuff. You can come down and find me there pretty much most of the time unless I'm away at an event. Failing that, you can find us on uh, the Fanta Tracks YouTube channel, which if you just literally type Fanta Tracks in, you can find our channel and it would be super cool if you subscribe to that. We produce content every Wednesday and Saturday. So if you subscribe to us, either Martin uh, or myself will have uh, put together and put out two new videos a week for you, and they cover a variety of subjects. Some of them are uh, event coverage, some of them are product reviews that uh, we've managed to do like little uh, in-depth reviews of, and some of them are you know things that you'd see pretty much everywhere, and some of the things are a little bit out there as well but we also do kind of uh, w when we get the opportunity kind of reaction pieces to like news that's going on as well so we've got like various different playlists but like you can find us there and please just talk to us we love to hear from people so like make comments and you know guaranteed we will respond to them in one form or another so you can find us either at all the cool stuff uh, all the cool stuff on Facebook or Farthest From on Facebook if you've never heard of the, the Vintage Toy Show or on the Fanta Tracks YouTube channel and just to let everybody know Fanta Tracks that's it everywhere Fanta Tracks on Twitter Facebook Instagram Google Plus YouTube uh, Smoke Signal Yogurt Pots we're everywhere and <laughs> we have people everywhere Can is happening soon we've got a Fanta Tracker at Can. we've got people everywhere so just look out for the gold and silver shirts and you'll probably find one of us in the crowd Come back and listen to us again in two weeks. Give us a thumbs up on iTunes as you do. Five stars, please, if you enjoy the show. Comments and reactions. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you want, as Dave says, and we'll, uh, we'll do our best to make it happen. And we'll see you all again soon in two weeks. <laughs>